What's up, Cerebral Football fans? My name is Steven Heider. This is Gate City Sports Channel. All right, guys, let's jump into today's topic. So the idea here is, is I want to bring forth the players that I think are scheme fits for Vic Fangio's system, all right? Now, when I say this, I want to preface one thing that I think is pretty important to kind of bring up in this conversation, guys, which is, okay, just because someone is or is not a perceived scheme fit does not necessarily exclude the Eagles from drafting a guy that maybe doesn't seem like a great scheme fit, right? I mean, there are teams that will make projections, even though the player has not played in similar schemes yet. They'll look from the attributes, things like that. So when I bring these guys forward to you, these are guys that, you know, when I say scheme fit, I'm looking for a couple things in particular. Number one, zone percentage of coverage. I'm looking for guys that are probably playing 30% or less of man coverage. It's only a pretty good range to know that you're dealing with a fairly zone heavy team, normally between 25 to like, early 30 percentages, you're dealing with a moderate base scheme, right? Teams that will employ some man concepts, teams that are still primarily zone, but they're not like way heavy, right? So where when you start getting under 20% zone guys that are 20% man, you're talking about a very, very zone heavy scheme in which the player is playing in. Uh, The other side to that is, is, you know, defining man coverage. Like when you look at man coverage gate, like what normally tips you off to like this guy's playing a lot in terms of the snap percentages over 40% of their snaps coming out of man. It's normally a pretty dang good indicator that you're dealing with a, a system, a scheme that is going to be somewhat man heavy. Now you notice that number is still less than 50%. There's It happens, but there are very few teams that will play over 50%. It does happen. You can find examples there, but it, it is a little bit rare in today's NFL. You play a little bit more zone than you do man most of the time. With that said, Vic Fangio runs kind of, you know, and we saw this from other coordinators who run these Fangio-esque systems. Vic Fangio does encompass some man principles, some man concepts inside of his zone scheme. So the first thing to to talk about is past just the percentages of zone versus man, which I will give you those figures, is to look at when they're playing zone, are you seeing some mirror technique? Are you seeing mirror and match being played by the defensive backs? And this is something that is very prominent on the film of Alabama guys. So it should not shock you that when I bring up a guy like Kool-Aid McKinley, Two things you should know, they play a moderate amount of man coverage, but still heavy zone, and they run a lot of mirror and match technique out of that man concept. Now, that he will play some press. He does have decent arm length. He's not like crazy in terms of the reach, but I mean, he's got decent, definitely above standard, which you would put for the threshold to play boundary if you're looking at him as a boundary corner, which I do view. Uh, Coley McKinley in the league, I do think he's going to be a boundary side corner. Um, but that's, I mean, that's how I looked at this young man. Now I want to get into the physical measurements. I want to get into some of the the concepts that we're going to discuss here. Then I'll get into the concerns, guys. I mean, when you're dealing with prospects in the 20s, anytime you're getting past essentially the top half of the NFL draft, it's not that these guys aren't going to be good. It's not that these guys can't be better than the dudes that get drafted in the top half of the first round. It's just that there's going to clearly be something there, something there to discuss, right? There's going to be an element of the unknown, and there's two things that, I want to talk about when it comes to Kool-Aid McKin- McKinstry in terms of that unknown kind of like, okay, these are, if, if there's going to be some issues with this young man, it's going to be based upon these two things. All right. Kool-Aid McKinstry came in about just short of six foot. It's really like five eleven and a little over half. I'm just going to give him six foot, man. I'm not going to sit there and argue over eighths of inches. All right. 199 pounds, so roughly about 200 pounds, 32 inch arm reach. This is something I've noticed over the last couple of draft classes that I'm seeing these young men do. They're not necessarily going through the process of getting their wingspans measured. Now, I would guess that that might be a little bit due to the financials of it, to where they want the guys to go study the film and not just solely rely on the measurables. Um, but with that said, you know, generally speaking, when I'm looking at something, when I'm trying to place a guy in terms of where their fit will be, if I'm looking at the boundary side, you can go like the guy can be as compact in the body frame as about 76 inches in the wingspan, but you don't want to be less than that, guys. I mean, I think it's just too much of an inherent disadvantage to be isolated on the top side, short side of the field against more rangier, lengthier wide receivers that can body you, position you like basketball and just pluck the ball out of the air on you all day, run across your face on these slant routes and things like that and just convert, convert, convert. So I do think there is a little bit of size. I do think sometimes people will pay a little too much attention to the arm reach. That's definitely one part of it. The other part of it is, is how developed they are in the chest and the broadness of the shoulders. And when you stretch those arms out, what's that wingspan? Cause that's really the part that matters when you're talking about that fight on that short side of the field, if you will, uh, for Kool-Aid, some other numbers that came here. And, and we got to remember this young man 
it was fighting through a Jones fracture. So Jones fracture is on the outside part of your foot. So Liz fracture is kind of up towards the top two, you know, toes going towards the middle of your foot. There's like a, you know, that's where that fracture occurs. The Jones fracture is more towards the too small and then kind of going back down the side of your foot. So he has a Jones fracture. Anytime you're dealing with foot injuries, I know they say that he will be ready for the season. You got to be a little, a little cautious here, right? That's, that's the first one I brought up about a cautionary tale of why this guy might be in the twenties instead of being a solidified, like right around the, the top half of the draft, you know, that 14 to 18 range, you know, if he, and there's not saying that he won't get drafted in that range guys. I'm saying if he ends up sliding down past the 20th pick, that's, that's probably a big part of it is that everyone's going to be a little cautious about that injury. And like I said, I know they're reporting that he will be a full go come season, but when you're dealing with foot injuries, guys, I'm not trying to hear that until I see it on the field. Foot injuries are really, really, really peculiar, especially when you're talking about playing a skill position like wide receiver or cornerback, especially cornerback in particular. It does worry me. Uh, the underlying athlete, this is the crazy thing when you do pro days, guys. There's some things I can't judge in terms of the explosion because I just don't have the, I don't have the split times. I have the full 40. He's a 447 40 guy, and he ran a 447 and a 452. Okay. Adequate speed, especially to play the boundary. I'm not really worried about his speed. What concerns me is because I don't know the 10 split. I can't tell you if this guy's like right there at a 1-5. You know, like that was the thing about Bradbury. Bradbury was around a, a 4-5 guy, but he was running like almost a 1-5. I think he was like a 1-5-3 test. Was he was one of the faster 10 splits as a young man, not Bradbury currently, guys. He had a lot of explosion to his frame and size. So that allowed him to kind of play that boundary role and definitely what they call the shallow zone area. Hasn't really, as, as the seasons have gone on, it's caught off a little bit. Uh, Kool-Aid had a 34 and a half inch vertical and 121, so 10 foot, one inch broad jump. Broad jump, vertical, 10 split together, normally give you a really good indicator of the actual explosion level of the player. I don't have the 10 split, guys. I will say that the broad jump, adequate. The vertical, not underlying concern, but I mean, this isn't a guy that's jumping 40 inches, you know. Uh, I would say he's probably what I would call just an adequate athlete, right? But here's my caveat here. That Jones fracture, I don't know how much this is playing into that, guys. I think it's reasonable to give this guy a pass and say, you know, this dude might be better than a 447 and a 452. This dude might be better than a 34 and a half inch vertical. This dude might actually be better than a 121 inch broad jump. This might have been a lot of getting prepared, trying to work on this foot, trying to rehab that, and then coming in and, and trying to. There, there is some caveat to this, right? There, there's a little bit of circumstantial things going on here to where I, I give him a little leadway in terms of the actual testing data and say, like, we may not really have the true numbers here, but these are still respectable numbers, even if they are the true numbers. We'll, we'll, this is not a limitation in terms of playing the boundary. Now, what I will say is I did not see any lateral movement drills. Now, I was reading articles. Let me see if I can't maybe pull up one of the other databases and see if they have any lateral uh, movement numbers because lateral movement, it will be important, guys, if you want to play a guy on like a – I'd say lateral movement to me is definitely more important when you're talking about the field side of things, right? When you're playing in a lot more space, you need to be a fairly decent lateral athlete or else it kind of catches up to you a little bit. I'm going to see if NFL Draft Buzz has the information. I doubt they do. They normally don't. I'm going to have to go to, like, Draft Scout and see if they have it. So, yeah, yeah, no, they're not giving me any lateral movement numbers for him. Um, Let me see if anyone else might have that lateral numbers. I might be able to go to his RAS score possibly and see if his RAS score pulls it up. The 33rd team won't have it more than likely. All right, so, yeah, I don't see anything that's definitive here, guys. I'm going to see if I can pull up his RAS. Uh, res. Yeah, so he didn't qualify for a RAS score, unfortunately. Okay, it is what it is, guys. I mean, sometimes there's going to be an element of the unknown with these prospects. You know, sometimes the only thing you can do is the old-fashioned thing we all had to do in the scouting world before we all paid attention to these crazy measurements, which is you have to actually go watch the film and judge the film. So you have to do it the old-school way with this one, guys. There's just not a lot of detail to add to it. But, it's, you know, sometimes that's great, though. Sometimes it's better to just not let data points skew your vision of what the film shows you, right? So that, that is something I will say about this is at least you kind of have to come about this honest and you can't let data points, measurables influence you. It's, it's going to be based upon what's on the film, basically. All right. I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be man snaps, right? So if I tell you a guy played 25.2% of man snaps, it gives you a very adequate and accurate count of how often he was in man. But that doesn't necessarily tell you how often he was being played, right? So, I mean, 
A guy could play 25% of man snaps. What if he, that was only eight snaps? Probably not an adequate sample size we should worry about, right? So with Kool-Aid and McKinstry, it's 25.3% of man snaps, which worked its way out to about 120 plus snaps, about 122 actually in coverage. They have him as 124, but I think there was two plays where, I don't know, maybe he was being used as, you know, he could have been used in a blitzing role, like a zone blitz type thing. Um, 122 snaps actually in coverage from man. So, I mean, you can see the percentages here that he's not, he's a heavy zone guy, but he's not, it's not like heavily skewed. Like when you're under 20% guys, that's when the concern comes in. That's when a guy is like, that's, that's a heavy, heavy zone. So I'm going to tell you right from the jump, Kool-Aid McKin- McKinstry, uh, Cooper DeJean, both of those guys definitely feel like fits for Fangio's system. I will say with Kool-Aid, I think the fits a little better because you have mirror and match technique here. So that means there is some actual encompassing of man concepts built into that zone system that are playing in Alabama. That should not be a shock, guys, because we saw Patrick Sertain play inside of Vic Fangio's scheme in Denver. So none of this should be shocking, right? I'm, nothing that I'm revealing to you should, you know, just knowing Alabama, you should kind of have a feel like, yeah, I kind of had an idea he was going to probably be a pretty dang good fit in terms of like the scheme aspect of things. So yeah, Kool Aid McKinstry, I'll say right off the jump, guys, from my study of him, looking everything over, just double checking myself on the numbers, I, the guy fits. Now I want to talk about his production because I was quite surprised with what I learned about this young man's production. I don't know when. I need to go look up when the Jones Frank injury occurred. I didn't see clear data yet on that in terms of dates. So I don't know when it occurred, but I will say this dude cooked on the season, guys. I was really pleased at what I saw from this guy's production standpoint. Uh, to begin with, when I look at coverages, he still gave up under 50% of receptions. He was targeted not, uh, 39 times on the year, only gave up 19 receptions. Sometimes the the you know the proof's in the pudding, which is the fact that you're only being targeted 39 times. Sometimes that tells you more than anything else, okay? Now, of those 19 completions, it worked its way out to 205 total yards. Here's the crazy thing about this young man. Not a single receiver got him for over 50 yards. Nobody did. Perfect 13 for 13. Okay? So let me, let me make sure I'm counting this right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, okay, 13 of 14. My bad, guys. All right? So no, or 14 of 14 there. Nobody got him for, for more than that. In terms of how many did he, how many teams did he hold under 25 yards receiving, which to me, that is the marker of elite production. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 out of 14 of his opponents. He held under 25 yards receiving guys. That's crazy. No, David, I'm not talking about him missing time. I'm talking about when the injury occurred in terms of judging the effect on the field. I, I don't have that information handy. I know he has the Jones injury, the Joe's, uh, the Jones fracture. I just don't know when that actually occurred. I'm not, I'm not positive on the exact date that occurred. So it's, it's a little tough to judge things when it comes to that. But I will tell you, anytime a guy is holding 14 out of 14 opponents under 50 yards receiving and 12 out of 14 opponents under 25 yards receiving, that guy played really well. Add to that that he's playing in the SEC. Ah, guys, this, this this dude, I mean, I got to be honest with you. If this dude's available at 22, man, this is a good selection. This this is a guy that there's not a whole lot to critique here. I'll give you a couple. I gave you the one, which is the Jones injury, the Jones fracture. I do have one other critique I'll give you about him. But I want to be honest. I mean, if you look at who he played and what he did here, he played Middle Tennessee, okay? He played Texas, USF, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Texas A&M, Arkansas, Tennessee, LSU, Kentucky, Chattanooga, Auburn, Georgia, and Michigan. The only teams that got him for over 25 yards was 47 yards he gave up to Texas, okay? And he gave up 40 yards to Texas A&M. This guy locked up against LSU, who's got two really good receivers. He was targeted four times, gave up one reception for eight yards. You know? It's, he was injured, David. He definitely had an injury. Um, it, that's that's crazy. That's crazy to me that he was that productive. Like, um, that's that's a crazy production stat, guys. I mean, that that's not something you normally find in these draft classes, especially in the SEC. In the SEC, I normally give a little leadway because the level of competition, I, like I said, I, I put out a tweet today where I said some people are kind of throwing some shade at the Big Ten receivers, not realizing who some of those Big Ten receivers are, like, you know, you give some some 
you know, a little bit of leadway when you're talking about guys that are playing inside of like the SEC at, at corner because it's tough, you know, stuff road to hoe. But I mean, in the past couple of years, the Big Ten has produced Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, JSN, Jaden Reed, Trey Palmer, Charlie Jones, uh, Hutchinson, Harrison Jr. is about to be drafted. Like, I, I mean, there there was decent talent in the Big Ten, guys. It's not like these corners didn't square up against anybody, right? So, I, I mean, I, I do think sometimes people get a little too carried away with trying to over-critique other conferences. And I think sometimes they may miss a little bit of it. Um, I'm telling you, his film's good, guys. <laughs> I really like the options. I mean, if the board rolls downhill, my options are, yeah, I got Cooper DeJean and I got Kool-Aid McKinstry. I don't care which way the Eagles lean. I think they got a player. Now, the difference is, is that Cooper DeJean was, had a little bit more ball production, if I'm being honest, by a little bit more pro, ball production. He had way more ball production. That's probably one of the only real things you can criticize Kool-Aid for, is he just was not very active around the football in terms of pass breakups, interceptions, things like that. I mean, that just wasn't his M.O., that he didn't get a whole lot of ball production, to be quite honest. But if you can cover a guy and get me off the field on third down, I'll take it, man. The way that teams were converting on us on third down, if you can get me off the field on third down, I mean, you know what? Maybe you can grow into, you know, honing your skills around playing the ball in the air. You know, I, I would much rather, yeah, I, I would much rather just kind of roll with that, man. I, I would much rather just let this man kind of, go out there and cook and maybe develop into the ball hawk thing later. Uh, right now we got guys that can ball hawk. You know, we got a couple guys that will make plays on the ball. So I'm not, not overly concerned about that. I think the real question becomes, as we're discussing the first round, and I want to get into a couple more comments because to me, the three guys I hear mentioned often in the first round that I think fit the Eagles schematically, I think Kool-Aid McKinstry is the best fit from a scheme perspective. I think Cooper DeJean is a really good fit from the scheme perspective. And I think Quinian Mitchell is a really good fit from the scheme perspective. You know, he plays about 30% man coverage. 133 snaps on the season is what that equated to for Quinian Mitchell. The difference is, is I think Kool-Aid McKinstry and I think Cooper DeJean are just solid. No duh, can play the boundary, no doubt about it. I think Quinian Mitchell is just flexible to where I think he's better off as a field corner, kind of in that slay role, but he could play the boundary for you. So if your goal, if your angle is to bring a guy in here to maybe move off of James Bradbury, and then you're going to develop Kaylee Ringo to play the field side and learn underneath Slay for one more year, remember how young Kaylee Ringo is, guys. Don't lose hope on Kaylee Ringo. as a very, very young prospect. Um, he's younger than a lot of these guys we're talking about. I'm telling you, man, they're, they're, I, I don't hate this avenue. If this, you know, They haven't gone cornerback since I think Lido Shepard in the first round, guys. I mean, check me, fact check me there. I could be making that up, guys. But I'm pretty sure they have not gone actually for a cornerback in the first round since Lido. You know, we all know that sometimes that can get overblown because sometimes it's just circumstance. The right guy that fits the scheme doesn't fall there. I saw some mock drafts that are bothering me, guys. I just want to stress this to y'all. I mean, this is my community, guys. We, we always talk. So I'm going to tell you the truth. What I saw in a few mocks that was irritating me, they were just like, oh, this team needs a corner. Insert plug this name here without any consideration. To if the dang player fit the scheme. I saw that happen so many times. Like, yeah, you can bank on development. You can bank on the fact that, you know, you're making a projection that while he hasn't done it, he can do it. But most of the time, guys do try to link up with something that feels like they could fit from scheme, either from prior experience or body type and movement ability that they're seeing on film and through the testing. Like, you can't just say, like, oh, they need a corner, so dart at the board. This is the corner we have available. Throw him on that's not how that works, man. <laughs> they still have to fit the scheme, man. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I know a few of you guys have hit me up a lot, and we are going to cover this prospect, so please don't don't lose hope here. We're not done covering all the prospects in this draft class. We're going to go over a few guys. I will tell you that one of my favorite corners in this entire draft class is probably not a great scheme fit for Vic Fangio. So when I say this guy is not a good scheme fit that you guys like, keep in mind, I'm in this boat too, and it does not mean the Eagles won't draft them. It just means they don't have the experience that you would expect in this, and we're making a projection, okay? Nate Wiggins is the next guy we're going to talk about probably this upcoming week. I, I've been promising you Nate Wiggins. We are going to go over Nate Wiggins. He is a very dominant man coverage corner. As a matter of fact, he played 58.7% of percentage of his snaps in man coverage, would equate it to 172 
coverage snaps on the season. It's a very man dominant corner. Uh, but to throw you an olive branch, a name that I really like, and I would be doing cartwheels across my living room if the Philadelphia Eagles drafted him around the second or third round, Max Melton from Rutgers. Another guy, 44.2. He's over that 40% threshold I set, guys. I said anything over 40. It's pretty heavy in man coverage. Max Melton, 44.2 percentage of his snaps out of man, which equates to about 150 coverage snaps in man coverage. So, you know, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they would not draft him. It doesn't mean they would not work in Fangio's scheme. It just means that the prior college production is a projection in terms of fitting the scheme. That's all that stuff means, guys. So we are going to get into those guys as we go on. There's a few dudes in this draft class that I am pretty high on. Um. I don't know. I may or may not cover Quinion Mitchell. I mean, I'm thinking about covering him just in case the Eagles do shock us and trade forward for somebody. I don't think that's going to happen, guys. I just, you know, my heart of hearts, I don't think they're going to trade up above the 16th pick to go get a Quinion Mitchell. I don't see that happening. I just think they would have to leverage too much. But if they do have, if that does happen, hey, man, we celebrating on draft day because I'm going to lose my mind on draft day if that happens. But I have my doubts that it will, to be quite honest. All right. Let's hit some comments, guys. I'll do the best I can to answer what you guys got. And uh, let's talk some football, guys. David, what's good, buddy? I think Kool-Aid would be a nice pickup for us. I agree with you, David. I think he's a good fit for the scheme. My guy Glizzy said, Gate, your knowledge and analysis on the game is amazing. You deserve a bigger fan base for sure. I appreciate it, man. You know what? I'm just enjoying having the kind of numbers to where, look, I can jump on here and I can easily talk to 100 people at any point in time. You know, if I jump on the right time of day, I've had live streams almost reach a thousand before, but my, my base is large enough to, to make things interesting and fun, but it's still small enough, a small enough community where I can interact with everybody. Lizzie. And, and I'm just, you know what, man, I'm, I'm enjoying it while we had that here. And the fact that I can go through pretty much every comment that comes my way and, and try to talk to you guys. He never missed time with the injury. Yeah, you're right, David. I don't think he missed any games. I didn't see anything on the, uh, on his actual law uh, game logs that would indicate he missed anything. I follow Bama and they never mentioned him being injured. Yeah. Uh, Saban tended to be tight lipped on injuries. Yeah. As long as he doesn't miss practice, it's probably similar to the NFL David where as long as he doesn't miss practice, then it doesn't actually have to be reported on any kind of injury report. Even if they are actually injured. <laughs> My guy Dank said, I watched the game versus Georgia and Carson Beck barely looked his way. Yeah. I mean, the dudes, he's a good player, man. I mean, just to add reference to what you're saying, man. I mean, you go look at Georgia and you look at what happened in that game. He was targeted one time. <laughs> he had one target in the Georgia game. So thank you. I saw very correctly. <laughs> uh, I never doubted that he was injured, uh, but I think it will be hard to pinpoint when it occurred. I, I think it will be as well. And it's, it's very possible, David, that it may not occur in season. It could have happened while he was prepping for, you know, the scouting combine. I mean, all those things are in play. It could have happened potentially outside of the season. I mean, I'm assuming it would happen in season, but I don't really know, David, to be honest. Um, Gate City, you see them doing or uh, going defense back in the first round. I don't think it's the layup. I don't think it, like five parts that like you just write that in pen. You buy it. You probably want to pencil that one in. Right. But I do think it's one of a few positions that they're clearly looking at. And they know that not only is it kind of an immediate need, they need a long-term solution here. They need a couple of really, really draftable assets there for the next four to five years it can develop. Um, I like Eli Ricks. I'd like to see Eli Ricks keep competing and trying to work his way in there. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if you got a chance to get, you know, to get that guy, you go get it. What's up, Bob? How you doing, buddy? If Kool-Aid is a fit, then Terriana Arnold is too, right? Yeah, he is, Bob. Yeah, uh, he's definitely a fit. I'll say that I think Kool-Aid is a little smoother in his work in doing the the mirror and match technique as compared to Terion, but I think Terion's the link that Terion plays with is very intriguing, man. And his versatility playing inside, outside. Um, but I will give Kool-Aid this, which is Kool-Aid is really good in run fits. He's really good at the shallow zone coming up and sticking those like, you know, screens and stuff. I, I think he plays with a lot of effort. Um, I don't know that's Terion's game. I think Terion's a little bit more slayish, but Slay is a great player, man. I mean, I wish we'd have drafted Slay back in the day. If we'd have had Slay for over 10 years, I mean, you know, I know sometimes people get annoyed with some of the antics with Slay, but I mean, I'm not going to take away from that dude's playing ability. That dude's a player. Max Milton. Yeah, you got it, Bob. That's that's my guy, but he's heavy man, you know? And if I'm going to say that, you know, 
this player played heavy man percentages, so he's not the perfect scheme fit per se. It's a projection that he can make it there. Then I got to be fair in what I, you know, how I analyze Max Melton on the on the back end of that evaluation too to say, well, we're Wiggins. I said this about Wiggins. Same thing is true here, right? Uh, Wiggins reminds me a lot of AJ Terrell. I like AJ Terrell. Um, Glizzy, I, I think he was a really good ball player. Okay, how do you like uh, Kaylin Carson line up for the scheme? The kid is a player. I got to watch more film, Bob, and, and kind of get a feel for that one. I only have so many of these dudes broken down in terms of the exact scheme fit. But what I will do for you, sir, is I will write the name down, and I will go ahead and I will make sure I get in at least four games of his, and I'll judge what they're doing you know, conceptually from a scheme standpoint and tell you what I see. Eagles drinking the Bama Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, that first name, bro. <laughs> the first name is a, it's a hit, bro. <laughs> uh, Gay City, if we trade one of the two second round picks, who do you see how he moving up for? Oh, that's a freaking great question, man. Dang, I just don't think like I like Jarrett Verse a lot. I don't think he's a fit perfectly. Listen, Josh Sweat, Brian Burns, all these Florida State guys that have played, you know, over there, they, they all are used to standing up as overhangs and rushing the passer, but I don't think he's necessarily the perfect fit for what Fangio wants to do there. So I don't know that you, Jared Verse, I think is a really good player. I think that, uh, I think Dallas is going to be gone by, by the time we could move up anywhere. Um, so I, I don't know that they would move up there because I don't know that scheme fit is perfect. I think a subtle movement forward for a particular offensive lineman, if they got a guy circled, because I don't think there's that many defensive linemen this year that, that are going to – I like Byron Murphy a lot, Fly Parks, and I would take that pick in a heartbeat because you put Byron Murphy besides Jalen Carter, Milton Williams. I mean, man, that – Jordan Davis, that, that defensive line, that interior D-line will be cooking again, Fly Parks. I'm not going to lie. But I don't know if I would trade forward to get him. It would be more of like if our targets are off the board, we don't love what's there at the offensive line spot. You know, the guys that we really highly had rated and think could be something, and those are gone – and we're into more of our projection guys on offensive line. You know, all the corners we had kind of circled, those guys were going to have to revert back to the second round. You know, if he came sliding down the board at 22 and he was clearly the best player on our board, I, I would I would probably slide him into that slot, Byron Murphy. Uh, in terms of trading up, I think corners. I, I think if they have specific corners that they believe are difference makers for Vic Fangio in this scheme, that's where I could see them leveraging and getting forward. Also offensive line. I, I just, I know how they are with the interior, the trenches period, defense, offense. They'll go after a dude and they'll trade forward. If they think that guy's going to be a difference maker for their scheme. I believe in chemistry's injury was diagnosed at the combine during a medical exam. Appreciate that NPC Smith. It gives a little clarity to it. Uh, what's your thoughts on Alabama offensive lineman, uh, JC Latham, a uh, good athlete, uh, seems to be a willing blocker. He said he's willing to go inside and play. I think he's a little long, to be honest, Bobby, about playing at guard, though. Um, we had this discussion like a night or two ago where we were talking about I don't think he's the perfect idealized candidate to play right guard because he's great in terms of the measurables for playing tackle. You know, you want a guy with over 35-inch arm reach and all that stuff to play outside. I mean, anytime you can leverage that kind of size out there, that's a good thing for, for outside. Inside, you got to be a little careful because there's a line of like kind of where it's a little too much and like, you can kind of get caught off balance, especially when you're like six, 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 seven. However, we brought this name up, Bobby, and none of us really knew his arm measurements because it's not widely reported. But Brandon Brooks was like a six foot five, six foot six guy. We don't know what his arm measurements were, but he ran, you know, three thirty five. I think JC Latham was like what three forty ish. You know, J uh, Peters was shorter, six four, thirty four inch arm reach. You know, generally speaking, with the interior guys, you're looking about thirty two and a half to about. Normally right around 34 inches in the arm reach is kind of where you see these interior offensive linemen minus centers. The, the amount of centers that are under like 33 inches in the arm reach this, this year, it's like almost every center <laughs> that's, that's out there is. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a matter of long-term projection. How, how confident are they on Tyler Steen, the lockdown right guard? How long are they willing to sit on a, on a right tackle? You know, are they going to, try to pull that Andre Dillard where you know it's going to be two years before the dude can never touch the field. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's kind of tough, man. <laughs> He's a good player, though. I think there's a lot there. I think the young man from um, Georgia, too, uh, Mims, I think he's a very intriguing developmental guy but does not have a lot of playing experience. 
I mean, it's, that's definitely uh, it has to be Jeff Stoutland signing off on that because I mean you're dealing with a guy you got to absolutely develop if you go with Mims. Dang it, I'm late. I missed the breakdown, but I love the Bahama corners. Are uh, you all good, Dante? Um, I- I'll give you a quick rundown real fast, Dante. While while you're here, Kool Aid. Whenever his measurables, just short of six foot. I gave him six foot because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock it out over a couple of eighths of inches here. 199 pounds, basically 200 pounds, guys. 32 inch arm reach. We talked about the fact that a lot of these guys in this draft cycle are refusing to do the wingspan. I think they want to be judged by the tape a little bit more, and I think they feel like that wingspan stuff is coming back to haunt some of these corners. And some of these guys are probably saying, like, you know, wingspan is something that can be increased a little bit, you know? So um, I I think that's part of it, Dante, to be quite honest. His uh, testing, we talked about the Jones injury, the Jones uh, fracture, and that we don't know how much that may have played a role in the testing numbers. So these numbers are adequate. They screen boundary corner, but they may not be the most accurate um, depiction of what his actual athleticism is because he might be dealing with something in the foot. So 447 and a 45240 were the two numbers that were put up there at his pro day. 34 and a half inch vertical, 121, 10 foot, one inch broad jump. Not, you know, these aren't crazy numbers, but they're respectable. They're what you expect from a boundary corner. He might have a little bit more athleticism than those numbers show though. Um, we talked about his scheme fit and, and why I think he's really probably the best scheme fit of all the first round guys I've heard mentioned. And I, I think it comes to down to two really big factors. The first factor is, is that the fact that the young man is, primarily a zone corner, but he has some man coverage snaps. And we know that Vic plays a heavy zone scheme, but he encompasses a lot of man concepts. So 25.3% of his snaps came out of man coverage, which worked its way out to about 122 snaps on the season. So nice middle area, right? Still zone heavy scheme, but we see there's capability there of getting a jam in. But outside of just the jam technique, I think the technique that he plays that makes him a great fit for Vic Fangio in this system is the fact that he plays a lot of mirror and match technique, and he's pretty dang fluent in the hips at doing it. He's pretty good on film. Everything I saw there tells me that uh, this young man could potentially be good. I mean, you never know. I mean, the guy's got to get on the field. You're dealing with a foot injury. There is unknown here, right? He doesn't have a ton of ball production. Not a lot of interceptions, not a lot of pass breakups in his career. However, when you look at his overall production, that overall freaking rap sheet, Dante, Anytime that I'm looking at a guy who held 14 out of 14 opponents to under 50 yards receiving and 12 out of 14 opponents to under 25 yards receiving and just had games where dudes just barely even tried to even look his way. One, two targets, some games he didn't even get targeted in. Like that speaks volumes, man. That means he just dude was respected on the football field. So if this guy's going to be available around where we can get to, to make that draft pick. Like I, I'm a fan of like, if I'm sitting there at 22 and somehow the board works out to where I've got the option to take a guy like a Cooper DeJean, who I don't, I, I think is a very good fit for, for Vic Fangio. He's a heavy zone guy. We don't know about that man aspect to him because he did not play a ton of man played very, very, very few snaps at man. However, crazy ball production, very smart, reads the quarterback. Well, reads route concepts. Well, will jump the play like Cooper DeJean a lot would not mind that pick. Love the Kool-Aid McKinsley from the, standpoint of how he fits the scheme mirror and match he's got some man skills there can play he can't play a jam technique but he's really good in terms of mirror and matching you know not a big mystery there coming from alabama patrick certain you know the eagles have also stolen two alabama guys in terms of the undrafted free agents because you know they, they know these guys fit the scheme um i like you know i'm a fan man i i think that that pick though those are good value if they come running, if they come down the hill that way. We can't predict it. There's only like four guys I think that have true first round grades, in my opinion, from the cornerback position. Maybe you can sneak a fifth guy in there. I'd say about five. I'll say five. Five guys that have that kind of potential for a first round evaluation. Um, so we're, we're dependent upon what happens in front of us, guys. No doubt about that. But I do think there is a reasonable expectation to suspect that one of these dudes could potentially slide down. My fear is here's my fear, Dante. These guys get this crap wrong every year for one very specific reason, in my opinion. They'll just do their mock drafts and say, this is the highest rated player I have on my board, and then neglect to analyze the exact scheme fit for the freaking team in terms of what they're projecting to be drafted there. So I am scared that we could get into a situation to where like a um, you know, a, a guy like Kool-Aid McKenzie goes, he's like maybe the second or the third guy comes off the board, and it shocks everybody. No one, no one saw that coming you know, prior to, to the draft. So, I mean, that that kind of scares me with a guy like this because 
if I'm seeing this, I know Dan right well, the NFL scouting departments are seeing it. You know, they're very, they're very well aware of the tape. They're very well aware of what the underlying data is here. And they're just probably trying to do the same thing we're doing, which is trying to link up and figure out if this is a scheme fit. And with so many freaking teams now playing this Vic Fangio style scheme, we got competition for him. You know what I mean? He's If he fits us, he's going to fit a lot of other teams. Although we can make the claim that, you know, but we got the guy though. <laughs> we actually got Vic. We're not, we're not running a version of Fangio. We're, we're running the Fangio. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I do think that there's some genuine interest there though, to be real. You know, when they sent Parker down there to evaluate him, you know, they met him at the combine. They've now met him on a top 30 visit. I mean, there's, there's clear interest here. Eagles may look to Denver at 12 for, for Mitchell. I like Quinion Mitchell. I don't think he's the, I think he's a good jazz. I labeled him as a good scheme fit. Not great because I, I think Quinion Mitchell has the ability to play boundary or field, but I do think he'd be better in that slay role as a field guy. Um, but I do think that he's, he could play either. And uh, he's my favorite corner out of this class in terms of the film. He's a guy that I turned on. I was like, oh, I like this guy a lot. But yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. Terry, I won't be there at 22. I think it's going to depend upon the scheme fits. I mean, that's my opinion too. David, I have Terry on Arnold as the second best corner in this class. But yeah, I'm a little conflicted on Wiggins. Yeah, I mean, Wiggins is smaller. Probably could use to add 5, 10 pounds to that frame. Plays physical. We'll come up and play the run. That young man's not scared to play the run. Um, Good coverage guy. I mean, if you're just talking coverage, Dante, that young man stays in phase. I'll tell you that. <laughs> he stays in phase with the receiver. Um, Yeah, I mean, size is going to be the thing and scheme fit. How much do you trust a guy that's, you know, sub 175 pounds? I mean, it's a couple pounds off. I probably would just round him up, just give him 175. But needs probably about 10 more pounds, especially if you're going to play a boundary role. Is more so played heavy man very light in terms of the zone coverage, but I do think has the eyes and the, and the knowledge to, to flip and play inside of his own system. I don't, I don't see anything from what I saw in the film that leads me to believe like, okay, this is going to be like, you know, a major disadvantage for this young man. I don't see a Sidney Jones, you know, situation uh, for you guys that haven't followed me for a long time. When we had Sidney Jones here, I had a saying, to where when you put Sidney Jones in man coverage, I thought Sidney Jones actually performed and showed off some of that underlying athleticism he had. But at a saying, every time that Jim Schwartz would play him in zone, when you're playing zone, you got to think, you got to read, you got to know the coverages, right? You got to understand the route combinations, you got to know where to fall inside your zone, all that. I used to say, when Sidney's thinking, Sidney's thinking. And, you know, I don't see that with Wiggins. It's more so the size, more so I'm making a projection. I can't say definitively. I'm just projecting on it, guys. You know, Dante, that's when it comes to Wiggins. That's a major projection from me. Gate off topic, but in my opinion, Nolan Smith is not big enough to hold up at outside linebacker edge. He does seem well suited for inside linebacker. Do you think he could make that switch successfully? Um, I think he can hold up in, in Fangio style just because Fangio is going to run a little bit more true to a 30 front. It's not like we don't play 30 fronts underneath Gannon. and we didn't play, you know, we played underneath the side as well. You know, Patricia played 30 fronts too. Um, so it's not like we never played 30 fronts, you know. But I will say that his run fits are different. And the way he plays his run fits are a little different from what those guys were doing. And uh, I, I think that he's a little better fit there. But if you're asking about the pure underlying data on this young man and what the film showed on him, can he play off ball? Yeah, I mean, he's got adequate arm reach if you're going to play him off ball. Good lateral movement ability. It's more so the knowledge gap, Bob. I mean, he had to make up a knowledge gap. I mean, it is a little different playing off ball stacked off ball than it is on ball as an overhang. So you have to make up that, uh, that gap in knowledge. Dante, I appreciate that, man. Appreciate you becoming a member, buddy. Uh, do you see sweat as a player who is able to stand up and drop back from the Eagle or from the edge position from the Eagle position, <laughs> fly Eagles or fly parks, or will he be lined up as a three technique? Um, I think you'll see him sometimes with his hands in the dirt more as a five, four eye to the five kind of technique there. Uh, maybe Fangio will flex him out, you know, do some seven and, and wide nine from time to time. He's not a heavy guy that does that. You know, this isn't, it's not his type of a scheme and system, but there could be a handful of plays where you see that in existence. I do think that they're going to primarily use him as an overhang. Um, he's dropped into coverage before. He's, it's probably going to uptick a little bit fly parks, but I don't think it'll be a drastic uptick for him. It's just going to be, he'll have a slight increase. Um, you got to know which way the pressure's coming from, right? So, uh, when it's coming strong side, then they're going to pretty much use that creeper. And then from the strong side where they're dropped, that strong side 
normally what you're going to see is you got the creeper falling out there to the flats and then you're going to have a zone blitz, you know, fire zones, fire zone blitz coming off the strong side. Uh, when you do weak, it's normally whip. So when you got a weak side creeper followed by a weak side blitz, a whip blitz, then, you know what I mean? That's normally a linebacker based thing that they're, they're normally bringing a linebacker when it's whip. Uh, when it's fire zone, that's when you get a nickel, a dollar. I, I know these numbers, this is the coins, but the dollar roll, the dollar alignment. Um, that's where you get outside cornerback. You know, that's where, that's where you kind of bring the outside pressure. It's going to come from those fire zones. That's where you'll see more linebacker, safety, some nickel. You could, you could technically use nickel as well in terms of, of playing whip and bringing whip pressure there. But yeah, it, it's going to be more so like how they play that scheme together in its entirety. Uh, who's your favorite defensive assistant? Hmm. It's an excellent question, man. There's a couple people that stand out to me in terms of being really, really good, knowledgeable guys. Um, to begin with, you know, before we ever made the mistake of letting Denard Wilson go, I was a huge Denard Wilson guy. thought Denard Wilson should have been named the defensive coordinator last year. But I warmed up. I came around to, to uh, Sean Desai, so I'm not going to sit here and act like I didn't eventually warm up to that signing. I did. I still was kind of in favor of it you know, being Denard Wilson's spot there. But in terms of the coaching staff, I do like Parker, who's the secondary coach out there. I do think that he's going to be a, a guy that is going to be able to run Vic Fangio's stuff and, and do that at a very high rate, Christian Parker. Um, I also really, really like our linebacker coach, uh, Bobby King. He's an inside linebacker coach. This guy's been around the league for a while. I think he's a smart guy. I'm not going to say that he was number one on the board of dudes that they were originally interviewing, but if this is your plan B or plan C, this is one heck of a plan B or plan C. Yeah, I, I I definitely think that uh, I like those two guys in particular defensively. I, I know the coaching staff. I, I don't want to throw shade here, so let me just kind of point out. I know the coaching staff really loves Jeremiah Washburn. Jim Washburn's his father. Jim Washburn, it, it's amazing. Jim Washburn kind of burnt bridges in Philly, but didn't burn them hard enough because they love his son, bro. They love Jeremiah. Uh, I don't know enough about Jeremiah, to be fair, Sam. I, I don't, you know, I know the front office loves him. I know they think really highly of him. I don't know enough about him, but uh, yeah, I'd love to actually get him a chance to get him on the show one time and interview and talk to him, but it's kind of hard, man. Like the, the, there's some red tape you got to go through to get coaches on. Even uh, I tried one year I entered, I like, I literally emailed every single person inside of the uh, sports science department trying to get someone to come on. And I had a few people that were willing to do it, but the red tape I would have to jump through to get them here. I was like, man, like I need to start that process way earlier <laughs> than what I did. So yeah. Five technique. Uh, I feel we need a few hitters out there in all three levels. We were in range to Edron Cooper, uh, Leonard Taylor, uh, James Williams, Cooper DeJean, uh, Mike Manstrell, the nickel from uh, Michigan. I don't hate your list, man. Your list is not a bad list. I would give, give Kool-Aid some credit on that list too, Marcus. That young man plays physical, I'm telling you. There is going to be a lot of players uh, that fall, especially in the second. Yeah, there's always somebody, Dante. You're right. There's always somebody. Like, there's always the unexpected guy that they had these first round ratings on that all of a sudden here we are in the mid second round. They're still available. Yeah, you're right. It'll be somebody. It's hard to pick them out, though, man. Like, I, in previous years, I thought I did pretty, pretty decently at, at finding and identifying them. I don't know. I have a strong grasp on that this year who it's going to be. It's going to be, yeah, yeah. I read that one. Sorry, guys. Uh, in second round, draft Edrin Cooper and an interior O lineman. Think about like BB or somebody like that. I also like that. I don't know that we'd be in range in the second round to get him, but uh, Barton, who's a, uh, he's a tackle at Duke, but this is a guy who's going to play guard in the league. He's going to be pretty good. Uh, he's a guy that I wouldn't mind plugging in at right guard. But, you know, honestly, like if they can get a, a guy that's going to be just a, a dominant player in the league. I'm not going to hate on the right guard situation and in, in addressing that, but I do feel like there's something there with Tyler Steen. I, you know, I, I'm not going to be disappointed if they wait till day three to get more of a developmental guy and then give, you know, my guy, depending on how the board falls. Like, I mean, I do think there's a point of like, like if there's this guy's on your board, he's the best player available. And you know, this guy can lock down this position for the next, you know, seven years. You know, obviously you make the pick, but you get what I'm saying, guys. Like if that doesn't line up, I'm not opposed to there being a day three pick that's developmental. And then you just plug in Tyler Steen in this year and, and 
giving that man a chance to lock it down. Wiggins makes me think of Hayes Haynes back in the day. Great old lineman draft in the fifth round. Uh, hi, Gay City. What do you think of Aeneas Smith? He is shifty and has a lot of yak. Yeah, um, there's this is a really good draft for in particular slot receivers, but also just guys that are that give you that yak ability. Uh, some of them do it through contact, some of them do it just through elusiveness and, and speed. So there's a lot of different flavors in this one, Donnie. But yeah, I think you're pointing out a guy that's got a little wiggle to him. I wanted Greg Williams. <laughs> Uh, Eagles fan, you remember me from back in the day. I was a huge Greg Williams guy myself, but I kind of gave up on that hope and dream, sir. <laughs> I wanted him the year that we uh, we hired Gannon. I wanted Greg Williams. Okay, City, what do you think of Cooper Beebe? Uh, big guy. I haven't really got too far into his film, Donnie. It's, it's hard to break down every one of these guys and, and give the proper attention that they require. It takes me some time to get around to all of them. But the little bit I saw from him, because I'm, I'm a pretty avid college football you know, fan, uh, big guy, strong guy. I think probably got second, third round, you know, day two written on him. Hard to say where he'll be exactly. I, my gut instinct is because he's an offensive lineman, he's an interior O lineman. Gut instinct is probably second round, but I've seen these dudes drop to the third as well. Thank you, China. Me too. I was sick when Wilson did get the DC job. Yep, me too. Wilson wanted to go with man principles for the defense, how he wasn't hearing it. Yeah, Sirianni too, Eagles fan. Yeah, I think that was a Sirianni thing as well. And I, look, I'm not, you guys know me. If you know me for a while, I'm not a Nick Sirianni hater. I'm not one of these guys out here with the pitch, pitchforks trying to run him out of town. But I do think that Sirianni's got some things where he needs to, he needs to develop a little bit as, as an executive coach. There's some areas, even as an executive coach, I think he's got to be a little better at. Like, I think when he had talented coordinators, he had talented assistants, you saw him be able to develop those guys and get those dudes jobs elsewhere when the onus fell on him a little bit more. And I, and I will admit for Nick offensively with Brian Johnson, there's more to the story than, than what a lot of people are reporting to you guys. Keep in mind when Brian Johnson took that spot, there was a personal relationship with Jalen hurts. And I don't think that's what doomed us. They expanded the role over the pre-snap offense with Jalen hurts. And it was Brian Johnson's role coming in here as a first time coordinator to help with that expansion being a previous quarterback himself. You know, played collegiately, played a little bit in the CFL and stuff like that. It was his role. He was supposed to help us expand that with, with Jalen Hurts. And I think that caught us a little bit. I think we may have tried to bite off too much too soon in terms of how we were doing that. Um, and I don't think, you know, I think Nick has to be somewhat responsible for that, right? I mean, I'm not saying you fire the guy, but I do think, like, you had a guy in Brian Johnson who I don't think is a guy who can't coach in the league. I, I think there's a reason why he got a job immediately as a passing game coordinator. Um, I don't think Nick did the best job managing it. And I think Nick's got to be better there. And Eagles fan going to your point about Sirianni, Wilson, this is a guy that the, the guys on the defensive side of the ball loved him. I love him as a coach. I knew this dude could do the job. I wish he'd have got the opportunity here, man. I wish Nick would have said, you know what? I understand what my philosophy is. Maybe we can revisit this. Maybe we can retalk this. Maybe, you know, Wilson and I, you know, Denard and I can get together and we can figure this out. We can figure a new approach. You know, we can figure out a, a new way of winning, you know, the big play rate, the turnover battle. We can find a new principle of doing it. It, it is what it is, Eagles fan. You know, I, I do hate that Denard Wilson didn't get the spot, man. It's a passing game today. Yeah, I'm with you there. Andrew Phillips is likely a second round cornerback. Eagles interviewed him. What do you think of him, Gate City? I haven't had a chance to go deep into his numbers, to be quite honest, and, and to kind of see. I like to go through it and get a feel for where did you struggle? Where did you play well? What happened? You know, like what caused the struggles? What caused you to play well? Where do you fit into the grand scheme of things? How do you fit in terms of the Philadelphia Eagles? Like what is ultimately like your scheme fit going to be in the league? Hard to say. I, I mean, some of these guys, like I said, man, it's really hard to, to run film on every single individual prospect. I will tell you, everybody who has has a combine visit and who has had a top 30 visit, I will absolutely give you some form of a breakdown on those guys just because like, it's a kind of a no-dos situation that you got to know this guy. I'll tell you right from the jump, that 44840, don't get deceived by that. Look at that 15110 split, that 42-inch vertical jump, and that 11-foot, 3-inch broad jump. This dude is explosive. That is a heck of an athlete. Um, 
190, 31 and a quarter inch arm reach, a little shorter than the arm reach, but anything over 31 inches, standard, you'll make it in the NFL, in my opinion. Don't know his wingspan. A lot of these guys didn't want to do that in this draft cycle. Yeah, I mean, probably just judging the numbers, I'm going to say just judging these these numbers, this is a guy that probably would really fit a man concept. I got to see more of his film, though, Donnie, but I'm just looking at that, just my experience around the game. When I see that kind of testing, these are guys that normally the athleticism really shows through in man coverage situations. Um, but if you know me, you know I was really intrigued by the young man the Colts drafted last year. Uh, Brent, whatever his name was. He, was. he was another guy that, you know, if you looked at the full 40 time, you wouldn't be impressed until you got down to those splits and you were like, whoa, who is this guy? <laughs> I watched some old Saints games. And I didn't realize how mediocre Jenkins was at cornerback. Yeah. Yes, sir. That uh, move to safety was was a necessity. <laughs> uh, what does Howie do so well? What? It is well in the second round and it's so hit or miss in the first and arguably third. I think you can argue depending on where you're picking in the first round, you're basically picking, you're picking guys that are in the same talent pool. You know what I mean? Like there's not a lot separating pick 22, pick 24, pick 26, 28 from pick 50 and 53. They're going to be in a fairly similar, you know, pool of players. But I think the difference is, and why we probably do miss at times Dante is we have specific position groups that we think makes financial sense to give fifth year options to. Not that we would never deviate from it, you know. We know that the Eagles were looking at CMC at one point. So, I mean, clearly they'll deviate from some of this if the player that they think is generational. But interior defensive line, uh, interior offensive line, offensive tackle, absolutely. Edge rusher, absolutely. Quarterback, absolutely. And I do think if they find the right guy at corner. Corner and wide receiver. Those two, you know, those are the that seven grouping of, of alignments there, positions. That's that's where you'll see them seek those fifth year options. The problem is, Dante, is when you're picking later in the first round and you're hard set like that. If you can't make the move backwards to get into proper drafting position, then you're kind of stuck drafting a guy that's at a, a position you deem worthy for the fifth year option, the contract stipulations of picking in the first. But that guy might be the fifth, sixth, seventh best player in a position. Um, Marcus Smith. <laughs> Dante's a good example of this. Um, Jalen Rager. Different circumstance with Rager. More necessitated by need for speed at that outside position. They wanted guys that could get vertical. They wanted guys that could stretch the field. They went Rager. They went Hightower. They went Quez Watkins. And then they traded for Marquise. Good one, which ironically, not one of those dudes really worked out long term, which is really funny that we took four four darts there and none of them hit. <laughs> um, but I mean, there was a clear necessity from the front office to stretch the field. I think that was prior to, to Nick being here, and you already saw the onus on big play rate. They want to play, and, and some of this was just schematically, to be fair, Dante. You remember that 2020 season, man. We like 2019 and parts of 2020. Man, we got guys that just could not release. We had guys that just could not beat anybody one on one. Like we were just really easy to lock up in coverage. We just didn't have, we didn't have enough speed. We didn't have enough team speed. So I, I get why they did it, but I, I think they they made a mistake. <laughs> they made some. They made some pretty major mistakes, to be quite honest. On nineteen and twenties drafts, corner at twenty two, inside linebacker at fifty, Corley fifty three, one twenty, Jonah Ellis. I don't hate that, Dank. I don't, I don't hate that set of, of picks. If the Eagles walked away with that, I'd be okay with that. I think it'd be a fairly successful draft. With Kellen Moore, do you see Jalen Moore under center and moving away from the shotgun? Um, it's an interesting question, Fly Parks. I'm going to say probably not because most of the time this is a quarterback preference. Some quarterbacks don't like to turn their their backs to the defense on play action. In particular, now you don't have to necessarily turn your back to the defense if you're not running play action. But if you're under center and you're running play action, you got to turn your backs to the defense. Some quarterbacks don't like to do that. But now if you're talking about are we going to see some changes there to where it's not a heavy implementation, but it's going to be more prominent than we've seen in the past? Potentially. Potentially. I mean, I think there's a potential for that to happen. If Wilson was here, Bradbury wouldn't be here. He's dookie at man coverage.
Yeah, I don't hate Sirianni. I hate the stubbornness. I'm thinking this may be a Howie and Lori thing when it comes to running the ball. Gate City, uh, do you think the talent at the top of the draft drops off after the top three guys in order? In other words, should the Eagles stand pat and draft Kool-Aid, Cooper, or should they draft down possibly? I think it depends on how the rest of the board crumbles, Marcus. Um, I do think that if you're just patient, it depends on how how much do you want to dress corner, Marcus? That's that's the issue, right? Is like if you're watching, you know, Queen and Mitchell come off the board, and then you watch, you know, Terry on Arnold comes off the board, then Nate Wiggins comes off the board, and now you're sitting there and like this, you know, 17th, 18th picks coming up, and you're starting to hear that Cooper DeJean, and you're starting to hear that Kool Aid McKinley are also potentially coming off the board before 22. You're probably the Eagles are probably going to want to get up there and target them if they feel like this is a major like. Hey, we've got to get young talent in here. You know, we, we got to start building that secondary now. Then they probably would go into that mode to go get those guys. Now, could you make it a, an honest assessment, Marcus, an honest evaluation that it may not be the popular pick, it may not be the sexy pick, but you know what? If Byron Murphy comes flying down the freaking board to 22 as an interior defensive lineman, you put that guy next to Jalen Carter, you put that guy next to Jordan Davis, you put that guy next to Milton Williams, you got some, you're cooking with fire on these interior defensive line. Once again, you got, you got impact players. I don't hate that pick. If you're talking about, look, gate at, at the end of the day, I don't love benching a guy for a year or two and waiting for lane. And I don't hate the fact that he could compete at right guard and get beat at right guard, or maybe we slide him at right guard and we're addressing right guard again, later on down the road. It's a cam Jurgen situation where cam's going to be the center, but we had to play him at right guard, just get him on the field. You can make the argument there for offensive line. I, I mean, if you ask Howie Roseman, I think he'll tell you straight up, Marcus, that he doesn't feel like you could ever have too many. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Arnold from Bama? A lot of the same things I said about Kool-Aid in terms of the scheme fit apply. I think the difference is I think Kool-Aid, from what I saw on the film, a little cleaner when it comes to mirror and match and, and some of the jam techniques. However, I thought um, Terry on Arnold in particular played to his leverage and his length. And I think he's very versatile in terms of being able to play each alignment in the secondary. I think it gives you a, a lot of versatility there. A um, little different. I, I, I genuinely think that Kool-Aid McKinley is going to be more of a boundary corner in the league, a right cornerback. Well, I think that when you take a look at Terry on Arnold, I think he's going to fit more so as kind of that left cornerback slash kind of field corner. It's going to have that fluidity of the hips, you know, ability to have that lateral movement, be able to play in space, use that length to disrupt. Now, I mean, you could play him on the boundary. You could play Terry on, but you know, I, I definitely think there's some subtle differences there, but they're both, they're both scheme fits. Hashtag like, I appreciate you guys. All right, guys, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes. If you guys got any more questions, if you guys want to ask about Kool-Aid. If you guys want to know, uh, you know, anything about Wiggins, if you want me to, to take a look at Wiggins and give you some of, well, we'll do Wiggins. Wiggins is coming up. I mean, if you guys want to know anything about like some of the other non corner, you can ask guys. I mean, I'll give you my perspective if I've actually had a chance to watch their tape and what I saw from the tape. Um, I tried not to get too high on these guys, man. I, I've done that in the past, guys, to where I got enamored with players, and it sucks when they don't draft them and you become committed to getting that player. But also, like, it really sucks when they don't work out. It really sucks. I don't care how good you are at this, guys. You'll be wrong in your evaluation eventually. <laughs> like, eventually you're going to get caught. You know what I mean? You're going to overvaluate somebody. You're going to, you know what I'm saying, have some biases that, that get you. You notice I don't talk a lot about Peyton Wilson. And uh, I'm an NC State guy. Big Peyton Wilson fan. Uh, I don't talk about Peyton Wilson that much, man, because I don't think that I can be trusted to give you um, adequate coverage there. I can't separate fandom there. I'm a fan of NC State. I'm a fan of Peyton Wilson. I don't know the man personally, but I've met that young man. I've watched him play for quite a few years now at NC State. Uh, he's a good player. Really good football player. I don't know if he's Luke Keekley. That's that's the camp, that's the name that got rolled downhill, and I hate when they do that. I hate when they start making a guy into someone that's probably Hall of Fame worthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if Keekley will go into Hall of Fame, but I, I think he's in the discussion at least. Um, if the Eagles feel that way, though, that's the only thing I'll say is if they feel that way about Edron Cooper, they feel that way about you know Colson, if they feel that way about you know any of these linebackers, if you feel that you've got a Brian Erlacher with the Bears. I don't mean body type, and I don't mean exact play style. I mean the importance to the scheme. Derek Brooks with the Broncos. Luke Keekley 
with the Panthers. If you got that kind of fit, you think for your scheme and linebacker guys, I don't think you mess around. Uh, Fontano, uh, we covered him earlier, Jim. I have a whole video about him where I went into depth about him. I think that he could play. He's got the, he's got appropriate arm reach to play outside as a tackle. Um, He's played a little bit of interior offensive line during his time at Washington, but he's not overly experienced there. But I think when you turn his film on and you see the nastiness he plays with, you see the strength inside of that grip he has. I do think that he's going to be a guy who could be not just a, oh, pull, play him at right guard until Lane moves on. I think I could potentially be, I think he could be your right guard of the future. I think if you draft him at 22, you plug him in there. I think that guy could be the right guard of your future. I definitely think he's very high on Eagles board. If I'm judging what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I see from the film, what I think I know about the schemes that are coming up and we're going to be playing, I think Kool-Aid. And I think that in particular, Fontano, I think both of those players are very, very high on the board. I think the Eagles like both of those guys a lot. I think they think they're very good, you know, pickups there. I would like to know how you like Patrick Satine tape versus Kool-Aid tape. How far away is it from that level of play? Um, Marcus, I will say that I'm a little up in the air about Kool-Aid in terms of what I can trust given the Jones, you know, injury, the Jones fracture with him and how that may have impacted him. But on film, Kool-Aid is a good athlete. Patrick Sertain is a much better athlete. Uh, Kool-Aid is a very well put together frame, six footish, just short of six footish. 199, 200 pounds, basically, 32-inch arm reach. Patrick Sertain is a bigger, stronger, faster. You get what I mean? Uh, both of them, though, the, I think the common thread, the common pull here, Marcus, is both of these guys are very fluid in the hips, and I think they're both exceptionally good at mirror and match technique. So when you get into that man concept and you mirror and match the movements of the receiver, I think both Patrick Sertain, I think Kool-Aid McKinstry, both are kind of special in that regard from what I saw there. And I do think that both of those guys have a decent jam. They can play with the jam technique. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all. We rocked out for over an hour. We will be back again. We're going to keep doing these live streams, man. I really do appreciate y'all so much guys. And uh, keep your suggestions in there, man. I'm, we're going to keep knocking out these cornerbacks for you. So if, if you guys really want a particular corner, like I know I promised you guys a couple of different names and I know you guys are probably like, yo, gate at some point, man, you know, you, you got to help us out here. We're going to do Max Melton. He's coming up. It's one of my favorites from this draft class. We're going to do Nate Wiggins. I, I promise you, if you guys want Nate, Nate Wiggins next, I'll do Nate Wiggins next, guys, for you. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all, man, and I'll see you guys later on.